Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. How do we show humility by not worrying? All I'm saying when I worry is, excuse me God, I, I think I can take care of this. I got an idea. The Bible says that worry and the cares and the anxieties of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, chokes the word. Spend all that time that you're spending worrying, meditating on the word of God. Fight the good fight. Get out your Bible and start saying some stuff out loud. Your own voice will disrupt the wrong thoughts you're having. You'll believe more of what you say than what anybody else says. Make a decision you're not going to live in worry. Humans are the only species of creation that worries. And we are supposed to be the most intelligent. <laughs> We're like the cream of the crop. Everybody else gets it. Trees don't worry. <laughs> Birds don't worry. Rabbits don't worry. Flowers don't worry. Lions don't worry. Pigs don't worry. Cows don't worry. Oh, but us smart ones, the wise bunch, the intelligent group, we worry. Nobody else worries. Matthew 25. Or Matthew 6, I'm sorry. The practicality of how not to worry. Learn how to get some humility. Learn what you can do and what you can't do. <laughs> do what God tells you to do, but stay away from trying to do anything He didn't tell you to do. Do what you can do, God will do what you can't do. Matthew 6, therefore I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried about your life. The next time you start to worry, just have a little talk with yourself and say, all right, stop it. Right now, just stop it. Talk to yourself, say, this is not going to do any good. I've been there, done that. I'm not going to waste this day tormenting myself and making myself miserable, thinking about this thing over and over and over. God, I cast it on you. I give it to you. And then you know what you should do? Go get involved in something else that'll take your, your time and your mind, something that's going to be happy, something that's going to be helpful, something that's going to be joyful and peaceful. Amen? Amen? Therefore, I tell you, stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, and worried about your life. What you shall eat or what you shall drink or about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life greater in quality than food? And the body far above and more excellent than clothes. Now here we go. Look at the birds. <laughs> birds don't worry. Have you ever seen a bird sitting on a branch having a breakdown wondering where the next worm was going to come down from? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father keeps feeding them. Are you not worth more than they are? And then he goes on and on and talks about the flowers, and even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as one of the flowers. And verse 31 says, therefore do not worry and be anxious, saying, if you worry, it's going to come out of your mouth. So Satan puts wrong thoughts in our head, hoping they will come out of our mouth because our words are powerful far beyond what we can even imagine. And when we start saying things, we either give God permission to work or we give the enemy permission to work. Can I tell you that again? When we start saying things in the middle, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. We're now in the middle, we're in the storm, and we're going to say something. So what we say can either give God permission to work, what we need to be saying is, God, I trust you, I lean and rely on you, I don't like this, it doesn't feel good, but I believe that you are in control, and I trust that this will all work out good in the end. Give me the grace to be stable in it. Now God can go to work. But on the other hand,
If you open your mouth and say, I don't know what, we're what are we going to do? I don't know, we're going to drown. This, this is gonna be now the enemy's going, ah. <laughs> Woo! Got him again. What does Psalm 91, 1 and 2 say? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can come against. I will say of the Lord. What are you saying of the Lord? I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my high tower. In Him I will put my trust. On Him I will lean and rely. I will say of the Lord. What are we saying about the Lord? Worry is a thief. It steals your peace. It steals your joy. And more than anything, it steals your today. Today. This is the day the Lord has made. I can't guarantee you're going to get another one. I hope you do. I hope I do. I think I will. But what if I don't? I don't want to waste the last one that I had. The present is the greatest present that God ever gives us. The moment that we have is to be enjoyed. We don't worry and waste this moment worrying about one that's already gone and we can't do anything about or worrying about one that's coming up that we don't have any control over yet. That's why you got to leave the past and the future in God's hands. Letting go of what lies behind, having faith for the future and enjoy the moment. Enjoy the moment. Come on. And then he goes on here, verse 34, so don't worry or be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will have worries and anxieties of its own, sufficient for each day is its own trouble. You know, any of the disciples that were worriers, I mean, I bet they were ready for the mental institution before long. Because he just really pulled some stuff. If you're going to hang out with Jesus, you have no home, no place to lay your head. <laughs> you never know where you're going to be from one night to the next. Jesus said, follow me. And he didn't say how long they were going to be gone, when they'd get to see their families next. They didn't ask what hotel they were going to stay in, what the insurance benefits were. Jesus just said, follow me. And they went and followed him. They got to carry no extra food. He told them to feed 5,000 people. And they said, we don't have anything. He said, what do you have? They found a little boy's lunch. Give it to me. And he made it grow. In Luke chapter 10, he sent the disciples out two by two, 70 of them, to go out and heal the sick and preach the gospel. And he said, do not take a purse with you. Do not take an extra bag. Do not take an extra pair of sandals. Don't even, he said, stay so focused that you don't even slow down your journey by stopping along the way to wish somebody well. Wow. I mean, he sent these guys out to do a job, and he said, I don't want you worrying about anything. I don't want you getting caught up and wondering about what's going to happen tomorrow. He's trying to make a point. When he sends us to do something, he will provide for us what we need, and we don't need to be worrying about it. You know, it's so exciting when I say, we have a worldwide ministry, and we're on television in two-thirds of the world, and we're, we're preaching in 40 languages, and we have mission works all over the world, and we're on 300 and some odd radio stations, 400 and some odd television stations. <laughs> if I didn't know how to trust God, I would be a complete lunatic. Total 100% lunatic. You have no idea how much money it takes every month to keep something like this up and running. <laughs> you know, God taught me, he took me the long hard way and taught me some things in the beginning, how to believe for my socks and my underwear and my skillets and my wash rags. And the other thing that will keep you from worrying in addition to being humble, two things, learn that you can't fix it. You need to say to yourself real often, you know, I'm not smart enough to figure this out, so I'm not going to waste my time trying. Can, can we try that? They say, I'm not smart enough to figure this out. <laughs> you don't sound convinced. Let's try it again. 
Some of you even had some really weird looks on your face. I'm not smart enough to be. It's like we really want to be the one who's in control. Come on, say it with a smile. I'm not smart enough to figure this out. Now, that doesn't mean you're dumb. We have wisdom from God, and He'll show us what we need to see at the right time, but He doesn't want us trying to get it with our brain. Amen? Then the other thing that you have to have if you're going to not worry, first thing is humility. The second thing you have to have is experience with God. We hear the saying all the time, there's no teacher better than experience. And it's just not going to do, you're not ever going to learn to worry if you don't step out on the promises of God and see what God will do. That's exactly why the Bible says, even regarding tithing and giving in Malachi, it says, bring all the tithe, the full tenth of your income and your offerings into the storehouse so there might be meat in my house in due season to meet your needs and to meet other people's needs. And I will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great that you cannot contain it. And then he, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. And then he says, try me. Try me and prove it. So he's saying, if you don't believe it, try it. Do it and see what God does to you. How many of you know that you cannot outgive God? How many of you have seen amazing things happen in your life through giving? Oh my gosh, it's just like. So amazing, so amazing. And so I got experience with God back in those early days. I remember having this pathetic little prayer list. God, I need 12 washcloths. I was dish rags. I, I needed new dish rags so bad. And Dave and I just did not have any money. I mean, I had quit my job to prepare for ministry. And you know, I thought that one sacrifice should just bring us like, you know, into this huge level of abundance. And instead, I mean, we're believing God for our socks and underwear for years. <laughs> God's going to test your little heart to see if you're doing what you're doing for the right reason. One person understood that over here in this section. Today, everybody wants to get paid for every move they make, you know, but back when I was coming up, there was a whole lot of volunteering. <laughs> Amen. I think the Bible called it being a servant. Like serving. We had so many needs. And God always met those basic needs. But we didn't have no high level of living. I had to shop at garage sales for many years and go with my two or three bucks and believe God to find my kids tennis shoes. And in the meantime, I'm out preaching how God wants to bless us and prosper us and how we walk by faith. And sometimes it seemed kind of silly to be preaching it and yet feeling like it wasn't even working for me. But I was in the middle. Did you hear me? I was in the middle. I had got in the boat. Jesus said, let us cross over to the other side. But we weren't on the other side yet. I was in the middle. And what I did in the middle determined if I would ever get to the other side. And it determined how long it would take me to get to the other side. And I can tell you that I messed around in the boat way too long. But I'm trying to help you not to make some of the same mistakes that I did. And what did I learn? I learned I am not smart enough to solve my own problems. I learned I cannot change my husband. I cannot change my kids. I cannot run the world. It is too difficult. God, if you can't do this, it is never going to get done. But one thing I'm not doing, I am not tormenting myself one more day. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Look at Mama Joyce. Why should you make yourself miserable over somebody else's bad choice? <laughs> Now, now look, here comes another good one. <laughs> if you're living with somebody that does not want to be happy, <laughs> why let it steal your joy? 
You ought to drive them nuts and be joyful enough for both of you. Amen? Amen. Come on, don't be codependent on other people's messes. Well, if you're not happy, I can't be happy. Listen, I was not happy a long time, and my husband stayed happy every day. <laughs> oh, his happiness about drove me crazy. I mean, the man absolutely would not be miserable with me. He just refused. He was like, I'm going to enjoy myself. You can do what you want to. <laughs> oh, the rage inside of me. Because, you know, miserable people want to make everybody else miserable. They want to control everybody else with their misery. Come on. You know the saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. But actually, Dave's stability of keeping his joy, no matter what was going on and no matter what I was doing, was one of the things that caused me to have breakthrough in my life. And you don't need to get in somebody else's mess with them and let them make you miserable. You need to remain stable so they can see that their circumstances don't have to control them. And all those years, God provided for us so faithfully, different way every month. We were $40 short a month of even being able to pay our bills. And every month, God would come through. So, I mean, some way, somehow. I mean, it was just like, those days when I look back, they were so precious. That's what develops relationship between you and God. When you have nobody to go to but God. We didn't have parents that we could go to for help. We didn't have sisters and brothers that we could go to for help. We had God. <laughs> we had God. Now, I could have gone back to work and forgotten the whole ministry thing. Because I was suffering. We were sacrificing. But oh, how many of you know I'm so glad today that I didn't, that I made it through the middle. Man, I'm glad I made it through the middle. And I want you to make it through the middle, but I'd like you to make it quicker than I did. And I'm telling you, you don't need to frustrate yourself about all the things you're frustrating yourself about. It's useless. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace that passes understanding shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Cast all your care on Him, for He careth for you. But before that, in 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that in due time He might exalt you, casting all your care on Him. How do we show humility? By not worrying. All I'm saying when I worry is, Excuse me, God, I, I think I can take care of this. I got an idea. I bet it's really funny when we tell God what, what we're suggesting He do. I caught myself about to do that the other day, and I certainly know better by now. Well, now, God, you could do this. <laughs> Stop worrying about stuff that you don't even need to be trying to deal with. Worrying, worrying, worrying. Have the gift of not knowing. A lot of stuff I don't know, and I'm so cool with it now, but I used to have to try to figure it out. I love Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and mind and lean not to your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. There it is again. Don't even think you're smart enough to figure out your problems. How many of you are worriers and figure-outers? <laughs> are you getting a revelation today how silly it is to torment yourself? Now, you know, me, me sharing with you does not going to mean that it's just automatically going to stop. I mean, you're going to have to confront this stuff and stand against it. You're going to have to make some declarations. I will not live. I will not live in worry. I will not live in worry. I will enjoy my life. I will have peace. God has left it for me, and I am going to have it in Jesus' name. I'm not going to live my life miserable. I cannot even imagine people who followed Jesus around what they thought. We have the situation one day where he went to a well, found a woman there, 
said, give me a drink. It's in John chapter 4. She said, well, why are you, a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan, for water? Because they had absolutely nothing to do with each other. And then she said, and on top of that, I'm a woman. And men didn't talk to women. They didn't know back then. That was a no-no too. And so he said, well, give me some water. And so she's already confused. And then he just takes it to another level. And he said, well, if you knew who it was you were talking to, you'd ask me for water and I would give you living water because the water you're drinking will never quench your thirst. But I've got water that I could give you. If you drink that living water, you'll never get thirsty again. Whoa, talk about a mind bender. And she comes with questions again. Well, where's your bucket? You don't have a bucket. <laughs> That's what I would have said. Well, yeah, where are you going to get your water? You don't even have a bucket. <laughs> and then she said, or he said, go call your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. And he said, well, you said that right. You've had four, and the guy you're living with now you're not married to. She's like, oh. <laughs> About that time, the disciples showed up, and they were astonished that he was talking to this woman, but they were too afraid to say anything. And then the next thing that John chapter 4 says, and they said to him, Rabbi, you need to eat. He said, oh, I have meat to eat that you know not of. <laughs> yeah, well, where is it at? All my meat is to do the will of my father. Let me tell you something. If you want to know everything and you're going to hang out with Jesus, you are in for a hard journey because there's going to be a whole lot of stuff that is not going to make one bit of sense to you and you're going to have to have the gift of trust. I trust you, God. I trust you. Like the blind man trying to get over there to the water, you know. Jesus rubs mud on the guy's eyes and he's blind and he tells him to go wash in a pool of water. Excuse me, I'm blind. How am I supposed to get there? God just wants you to go. Just start moving. If I can just get people moving in some direction. <laughs> Woo, help us, Jesus. Do your responsibility, cast your care. Ephesians 6 is talking about spiritual warfare, and it says, Do all the crisis demands, then stand firmly in your place. It's not that you don't do anything. I Dave says it this way, and I love it. Do your responsibility, cast your care. What is my responsibility when I'm in the storm? Pray, say, <laughs> do whatever God tells me to do. My part is to pray, keep a good confession, stay positive, don't start complaining in your storms. Woo, I wish I had about another hour to speak on complaining. Don't start feeling sorry for yourself. Don't get jealous of other people who don't have your problems. Well, it must be nice to have no problems. <laughs> I mean, before I learned better, you know, the way I was raised, I resented it. And, you know, when I would come across people that had these little Pollyanna upbringings, I would think, oh, it must be nice to have good parents. It must be nice. It must be nice. <laughs> you got to lose the attitude. God's got an individual plan for each one of us, and the way He works with you will not be like the way He works with anybody else. But just because He's not doing for you the way He did for them doesn't mean that what He does for you is going to be inferior. Keep your commitments, if at all possible, during the storms in your life. That's so important. So many people today do not know how to keep their commitments. You got to do what you said you would do, especially when it's hard to do. I said, you got to do what you said you would do, especially when it's hard to do. I think I need to say that one more time. You got to do what you said you would do, especially when it's hard to do. And then extremely important. All the time that you're in the storms in your life, one of the most important things for you to do in the middle is keep reaching out to other people. Keep being a blessing to other people. 
keep sowing that seed of time and service and love and encouragement to other people so you can keep having a harvest in your life. There's something for you to do, but it's not worry. <laughs> it's not reason. It's trusting God, reaching out to others. In Psalm 37, it talks about the wicked and the evil times, and it says, trust in the Lord and do good. So simple. We complicate. Well, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> trust God and do good. Trust God and do good. I don't know how long it will take you to get to the other side, but I do know this. We're going to the other side. Amen? We are going to the other side. You are looking at somebody that is going to the other side. Can I get a witness? Is anybody going to the other side? Amen. Well, as we talked about today, when we step out in faith, we always have a beginning and hopefully we have an end, but it's really what happens in the middle that makes all the difference in the world. And the reason I say hopefully we have an end is because if we don't make the right decisions in the middle of our faith or while we're waiting to see the fulfillment of the promises of God, then many people turn back and never get to the end of their dreams and their visions. And so I really want to encourage you in the midst of whatever you're doing, you're believing God, but cast your care on Him and believe that if you'll just keep doing what you know that you should do day after day after day after day, you're going to get to the end and it's going to be beautiful. I love to say that it's not what we do once that gives us a good result. It's what we do right over and over and over and over again. So maybe you're watching today and you feel like you've been trying to do what's right, but you're getting a little weary. Well, the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not.